thank you very much for joining us uh, on today's private equity webinar with uh, Professor Tim Jenkinson. Um, the subject matter today is, is private equity still outperforming the public market? I will shortly be handing you over to, to, to Tim. Um, just a quick background. Uh, Tim is the head of our finance faculty here at the business school and has been for a number of years. He is also the director of our own private equity institute. Um, and Tim was one of the leading co-founders of the independent private equity research consortium, which has individuals such as Robert Harris and Steve Kaplan, our esteemed colleagues from um, Darden and the University of Chicago Booth. Uh, but I will uh, hand over to Tim. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar. Great. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for joining this webinar. Uh, I'm Tim Jenkinson, and I'm going to uh, try to answer this question: whether private equity is still outperforming public markets. It's uh, it's one of the main questions people ask because one of the um, main justifications for investors to put to put money into private equity is that they think they're going to get better returns than they could uh, in other alternatives. And the simplest alternative is simply to put your money to work in in public markets. Um, and indeed, if you look at this quote that's on the screen, um, which was in the Financial Times uh, towards the end of last year, um, there's an assertion there that most investors are becoming more confident about private equity's ability to beat the public markets. And um, it's interesting because I've uh, posed that question to two sets of uh, uh, investors in recent months since that's come out um, to see what they thought. I posed it to a a large group of private equity investors at the big um, uh, super investor conference in um, in Amsterdam, and uh, and they were mainly private equity investors, um, and more or less everybody agreed with this uh, statement. I don't think any hand went up saying that they disagreed. And only um, uh, two days ago, I posed the same uh, question to a bunch of public equity investors, and everybody disagreed with it. Um, so it's a, it's a contentious issue, and I think what I'm going to do today is to, to briefly uh, give you my perspective on this, um, and I'm going to talk for about uh, maybe 25 minutes or something like that, and then give you a chance to answer, ask any questions um, online, and I will try to answer them as much as, as well as I can, and then um, uh, we'll take about 15 minutes of questions. So that's the, that's the context of today. And... Um, when it comes to this question, I have some uh, form. Uh, the research, which was published a couple of uh, years ago now, um, called uh, Private Equity Performance, What Do We Know, was published in the Journal of Finance, which is the leading academic journal in finance in the world. And um, uh, the answer to that, so that you don't have to go away and read this article, is that um, uh, in the case of US buyout funds, which we focused on at the time, um, we found that they fairly consistently outperform public markets by about 3% per annum. Um, we found varied evidence on US venture capital funds, which had done extremely well in the 1990s, but had really underperformed in the 2000s. And um, more recently, we've updated some of that analysis and extended it to Europe, uh, and, and um, we found similar results. And what I want to do today is to to some extent, to um, ask the question, well, what does the what do the latest figures actually show about buyout returns, and what do the longer term trends look like? Um, so we'll look back over the last five years and see how the market's been changing, um, and also to look at how the distribution of returns has been changing between funds, because it's often been said that you don't invest in private equity for the average return; um, you really invest with the good managers who uh, get, get, get you, you know, excellent returns. And so I'm going to look and see how much that distribution has been changing. And then finally, uh, I want to look at uh, venture capital. I realize it's sort of um, uh, it had a lot of attention recently in terms of sky-high valuations, lots of money flooding in. But really for the last decade, really since probably 15 years since the 
end of the dot-com bubble. Um, it's really been the ugly duckling of private equity that nobody, um, investors have increasingly been pulling their money out of uh, venture capital because of fears that the returns weren't good enough. And I'm going to give you a snapshot of those sorts of facts as well. And some of this type of um, analysis is the sort of thing that we go into in a lot more detail in our courses here, including our Oxford Private Equity Program, which uh, uh, happens in May. Um, so let's get on with it. I'm going to talk to you about, uh, or the data I'm going to show you is essentially 100% from the investors. Um, it's data that uh, we have as a result of the research um, alliance we have with uh, Burgess Group who provide decision tools for investors and it's sourced from about between two and three hundred of the major investors um, that have uh, their whole past history of their cash flows and valuations, NAVs, that means net asset values um, for unrealized investments and provide them uh, to Burgess so that they can track them and provide um, information on returns and other aspects of their performance. And so this is a very large proportion of the industry we're looking at here. Uh, it's about $2 trillion of buyout funds and about $500 billion of venture capital funds, reflecting the fact that venture capital funds are a lot smaller in size normally. You'll see that there's roughly equal number of funds that are in the database. All the returns I'm going to be talking about are net of fees and carried interest, or carry, profit share in other words, and so they are the returns that the investors actually experienced. Um, not all of the investments will have been realized, and where they're not realized uh, will include the latest net asset values of them, the latest valuations of those uh, portfolio companies. They may turn out to be right or wrong, but most of the research shows that they're if anything, they tend to be conservative estimates. And I'll come back to that fact a little bit later on. So what I'm going to do is to look at um, uh, three different types of ways of measuring returns. I'm going to start off with the way that um, I like the best, which is looking at what are called public market equivalent returns. Um, what that does is it basically says every time you, if you, every time you gave some money to a private equity fund, um, you put some money into a public market index, whatever is your favorite public market index, like the S&P 500 or the MSCI Europe index. Um, and when you get a distribution from a private equity fund, when they sell something and give you some money back, you take the money out of the public market. And so you have these two mimicking portfolios, one of which is public market investments and the other one's private equity investments. And you see at the end of the life of the fund, which bucket has the most money in it. And that's what I'm going to start off by looking at. But I, this is not the normal way to look at uh, the performance of the industry. The, the, um, the funds, in particular, still like talking about money multiples and IRRs. Money multiples are where you look at the amount of money you got back relative to the amount of money you put in. It doesn't take account of what you could have done else you could have done with that money. It just says, I put in £100 and I got back £150, and that gives me a money multiple of 1.5. You can see the problem there. What happens if the stock market had tripled in that period? That wouldn't look very good. On the other hand, if the stock market had fallen by 50%, you've done brilliantly. So there's a problem with money multiples, in my view, and that's why you tend, we tend to look at public market equivalent returns. I'll also look at IRRs, which are like rates of return, annualized rates of return, which is again one of the things that the, um, uh, the industry tends to focus on, although investors are increasingly interested in public market equivalent returns. I'm going to start with buyouts and then look at venture capital. So I want to dial the clock back to 2011, Q1 2011. Why have I done that? Because this is where the data up to the point that we published that paper that I referred to at the start the, in the Journal of Finance. We use data up to the end of quarter one, 2011. And what I've shown here in the bold line is the median fund PME over all the funds in that sample uh, that I talked about, that $2 trillion of, uh, of funds. You'll notice here that the um, I've extended, you'll see in the footnote, it says global buyout funds. So actually, I the, the paper had originally just focused on the US. This is now um, extended to global funds. 
And you'll see that the same sort of result uh, goes through in terms of if you ignore the last few years for a minute, which I'll come back to, there was almost no year except for 1995 when private equity didn't beat public markets. How do I interpret that? Because in every uh, vintage year, in every year um, uh, until uh, about 2006, with the exception of 1995, the average, the median PME here is above one. In other words, you ended up with more money from private equity than you did through the public markets. And this averaged about 25% over that life of the fund, which is how we get to the, to the sort of 3% annual return. Um, because the fund, it doesn't have its money invested uh, evenly throughout those the sort of 10, 12 year life. Um, and so when you work it out on an annualized basis, it tends to be about a 3% return. You'll notice some, you know, the, the, the more recent vintages are have lower performance, as you might expect, given that the financial crisis struck after 2000, um, and, and in 2008, and these are funds that started investing in 2007 uh, and 2008, and indeed 2009 funds were investing post-financial crisis. Now, that's what we saw in 2011. The, those recent funds were very immature, many of them hadn't actually invested that much, but I'm now going to click the, the clock forward and show you how performance has evolved over the last five years. So you have to watch the screen quite carefully at this stage because the only thing that's going to change is the date at the top. And this will be this will show you how those returns have evolved. So if we tick the clock forward one year, that's what happens. You'll see very moderate movements in those in those um, uh, lines. Obviously, the early years, nothing much changed because actually these funds were mature and they'd given all the cash back to investors. So you have to look towards the right hand side of the chart to see what's happening. Let's take it forward another year. See some slight changes, but not very much. Let's go forward another year to 2014. It's flattening out a bit uh, in recent years. And then the most recent data that we have available to us at the moment is Q2 2015, where again, you've seen the slight flattening out in recent years um, and slight lowering, if you like, uh, in some of those mid 2000s vintages. Now, to give you a sense about what that you know, the, the before and after. I've now put those together on one chart. So the blue line is what we were seeing in 2011. And the, um, the sort of orangey line is the what we see to, in the most recent data. You'll see that the sort of mid-2000s vintages have got a little bit worse, and the more recent ones before and after the financial crisis have got a little bit better, the 2008-9s. Um, so nothing much, in some ways nothing much has changed in the last five years and that's very surprising because as we know lots of things have been happening to the stock market over the last five years. We've seen huge increases in the stock market um, since the financial crisis and yet as we tick the clock forward from 2011 to 15, we see that the private equity returns have been moving pretty much in lockstep with public markets. Um, and that's not altogether surprising in my view, um, because the, um, the private equity firms have to sell their investments, and indeed they buy their investments, uh, from, often from public markets. Uh, sometimes they, they, they will buy, obviously buy private assets, but they're also valued relative to public markets. And when public markets do well, private equity does well in general. Um, and so what we've seen is this sort of, they, they've been moving in lockstep, um, and so, uh, you know, there hasn't been much change in the average PME over this period. However, there's two other things I want you to look at, one of which is the trend in this line. If you look here, even though on average over that period, clearly the PMEs have been above one, they've been falling for every vintage year since 2001, on average, the median fund PME has been falling for every year, with the exception of 2009, where there's a little tick up, every year since 2001. And also, um, you can see that every vintage year post-2005, the PME is at or below one. In other words, private equity has been 
doing about the same as or slightly worse than public markets since 2005. So I want you to keep those two things in your mind. Um, before, but I also want you to look at the, the, the distribution because everybody has always said that private equity is, a, is an asset class where there's a big difference in the performance between the, the best funds and the worst funds. Unlike public equity where the performance differences tend to be quite tight between the, say the upper quartile and the lower quartile uh, of funds. So what I've done on this chart is just show you what's been happening to that difference between the best and the worst. And again, you can see that it varies a bit from year to year, but it's definitely been coming down. And in the last few years, the difference between the top and the bottom quartile funds has been about 0.25 of a PME. In other words, you got about 25% more relative to public markets investing in the top quartile relative to the bottom quartile. And that's not as much as it used to be. It used to be more like 75% more. Um, and so there has been some convergence in the performance of private equity funds. So where do we stand today? So we've had this historically strong performance relative to public markets, which averaged historically 3 to 4% per annum. Looking back over the 90s, the thousands, the 1980s even, it goes back. Um, that's what we saw. But we've seen median PMEs declining steadily since 2001. And the more recent vintages actually uh, performing below public markets. And that we've had top quartile PMEs also falling steadily. So you can't take solace in the fact that, oh, well, that's the average is changing, has been falling, but the maybe the top performing funds are still, are still performing just as well. That isn't the case. Um, and we've got the, the, the gap between the top and the bottom quartile is closing. So one quote that, or one slogan that I would, I've sort of introduced here is that, is that everybody used to say, oh, you've got to get in the top quartile funds, but I say, top decile is the next is the new top quartile that if you're aiming for those sorts of returns that you historically got from the top quartile funds you actually now have to be in the top decile the top 10% of funds and that's very challenging if you're an investor to find those to spot which funds those are going to be but i also want to raise another question which is you know all those facts does this sound like a maturing asset class to you where where competition a new entrance and, and a wall of money is eroding the excess returns. I'll leave that hanging for you to uh, to make draw your conclusions on. Um, but if you um, believe that that's an issue, it certainly brings us back to the fees in all their variants and the carried interest because this is a very expensive asset class where you typically pay between one and a half and two percent in direct fees. There's a lot of fees that are given uh, that are, uh, are formed by portfolio companies, and the invest the funds tend to take a 20% profit share. Um, uh, so it's an expensive form of intermediation, and it raises questions in my mind about how sustainable those very high fees are. All the data I've showed you, just to reiterate, is net of those fees and profit shares. Um, however there is a more positive way to spin recent events and that's what I want to and this is what you generally hear from the uh, from the industry and there's some interesting differences here let's look at multiples for a moment, for, for a moment. this is just cash on cash multiples or rather for, for, for those where the investments have not been realized it also includes the uh, the remaining value of their investments. That's why it's called TVPI, total value to paid in capital. So it's it's cash and remaining investments to the amount of cash you paid in. You'll see that over the last four years, those have recovered very, very nicely. That in the tooth, for example, in the 2008 vintage back in 2011, just after uh, the, as the financial crisis was sort of working its way out, the, the amount of the valuations of those investments and the like was at roughly the amount that you put in. So it looked like for every dollar you put in, you, you had a dollar. Whereas now, those uh, funds have turned that dollar into a dollar fifty. But of course, you can work out why. Because public markets have re returned very strongly. And as public markets came back, the tide raised all the boats. It raised the it raised the public market companies and it raised the, raised the private equity companies. And I suppose one question that investors should ask is how much credit should you give to the private equity funds for, for macro trends 
in either direction, either if the market falls or the market rises. You're not really paying them to time the markets, you're paying them to do good investments. So I think that's why many academics and, and investors now are more interested in looking at not these absolute return measures, but relative to other forms of equity investment. What happens if we look at um, the IRRs? Well, here I've put IRR on the axis and I've drawn a line at 8%. Why 8? Because 8% 8 is the interest rate uh, or the internal rate of return that fund, many funds have to achieve before they get carried interest payments. And you can see here that now many of these funds are actually uh, going to be paid carried interest. And in particular, if you look at the more recent vintages since 2005, the median fund in most of those years is going to be paid carried interest, i.e. profit share for doing well. But remember what I showed you just a little earlier, that for those funds, they're performing at or near public market returns. So they're getting paid profit share for performing about in line with public markets or slightly below. Um, and so we're in a very interesting situation here. Um, that uh, that we've seen these big vintage years, which were about um, 800 billion was raised over the period before the financial crisis uh, broke, 2006 to 8. We now see that the median seven and eight funds, well into the carry, the six 2006 funds are close, but they've actually underperformed public markets. Um, so that raises some questions now. Of course, it's not over yet because the amount of um, those funds that are unrealized is quite high because they haven't been going that long. So if you look here, what I've done is I've given you another view inside how private equity works, which is to present to you both the realized multiple and the unrealized multiple. In other words, how much cash did you put in and how much cash have you had out? That's the realized multiple, which is in dark blue. And the unrealized amount is in light blue. And as you'd expect, the, the percentage of cash to unrealized goes up over time as you, as you get the more recent funds. And so clearly a lot could change in the next few years. And indeed, with recent falls in stock markets since the start of the year, some of those unrealized blue lines are definitely going to be lower. Um, because, as, as I've shown earlier, private equity moves lockstep very often with public equity, and so therefore those blue lines are going to come back, and maybe some of those funds are no longer in the carry. Uh, um, they may be waiting for the next stock market rally. So it's not over yet, but I think um, there's, the evidence I've shown is the sort of most recent that we can, that we can find. Now, what about venture capital? Because I've been talking there all about buyouts. And if you do the same analysis for them, it's a very different story. I've shown here how, how good the performance was in many of those early years uh, of uh, venture capital back in the 90s. And how since then, since really the dot-com bubble burst, um, the performance has been fairly, fairly spectacularly below public markets. But, um, and you know, if you look in the last four years how the data is, how, uh, has evolved, if anything, some of those mid-2000s funds have actually done worse than they were in the books for in back in the early 2000s. So they haven't realized the returns that, that venture capitalists thought they were going to. On the other hand, the last few vintages have done, have been revised upwards. So the 2008, sort of, certainly the 2009 and 10 vintages have actually been revised upwards so that they're actually looking like they, they may outperform public markets. Um, so if you put these two, um, uh, you know, sort of look at it in a slightly different way and just look at the multiples, you see a similar story that there's sort of been an upward trend in multiples over time. So that people have, the investors in private equity funds have now been getting their money back and indeed to some extent the more recent vintages have done quite well that you're getting, for every dollar you put in, you've been getting back close to $1.5, which has led venture capital to have a bit of a renaissance, as we've seen, with more money being assigned to it um, and the returns going up. 
If you look at IRRs, it's a similar story. The IRRs have definitely been getting better. If you notice, these charts have a different slope to the buyout charts. These are all sloping upwards. The buyout ones are sloping downwards, um, generally speaking. And that's, I think, in my view, because, because investors retreated out of venture capital and the returns got better because there was less money chasing deals. Now, if you want to put all these things together, um, buyouts and VC on the same chart, you get an interesting uh, uh, chart, I think, out of that, that for much of the last, you know, the 2000s, buyouts were doing a lot better than VC, um, if you look at the, the money multiples um, here. But you can see that actually in money multiple terms, the VC funds seem to have been doing sort of the same or even slightly better since 2007. And so I think it's a, a, there's a good case for arguing that the VC is no longer the ugly duckling. Um, but of course, you always got to look in the headlights rather than the rearview mirror. There's been a lot of money flooding into venture capital in the last few years. And that's generally speaking a bad thing for returns. So it may be that the people who were brave and invested in 2009-10 are the ones who are going to make the good returns. And those who are flooding in in 2015-16 may be making uh, much less good returns uh, in the future. So just to conclude this brief sort of uh, canter around the evidence on private equity returns and trying to give you a historical perspective and also a really up-to-date perspective, I think my view is, is that as each year goes by, the sort of evidence that private equity returns are similar, are converging on public equity returns, actually get stronger. Um, that there's those, those charts showing the, the sort of, especially on the buyout side, the reductions in public market equivalent returns down to public market levels seems to be a secular trend that is, um, has been going on for a few years now. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, even though historically the, the results have been strong, the uh, recent performance has only been at or just below, if anything, uh, public markets. Now, it's certainly true that multiples and IRRs have, have risen uh, and recovered um, as the markets have recovered. But the strange thing about this is that that means that, you know, that the fees and carried interest go up just because the markets have gone up. And I find that difficult to see why that's sensible. Um, you want people to beat their close benchmarks, not to, to get paid when the benchmark itself goes up. And so that's why I ask the question whether this is sensible. And, uh, I, you know, that's for you to judge as much as me. It hasn't changed so far, and investors haven't, um, haven't really been putting so much um, pressure on the funds to change that part of their remuneration. Um, I think that my interpretation is that these skills that private equity funds have are scarce um, and eventually what happens is investors want to put money to work with people with scarce skills and, and, and ultimately a lot of the returns are appropriated by those funds and this is what we've seen in many other asset classes in hedge funds, in mutual funds and the like. Um, and so uh, I think that tends to happen over time and um, I think that that leads to more competition which drives down returns. When that happens, in most other asset classes, pressure comes on the fees and that I think has got to, is going to happen in private equity. There are just, you know, there's too many fees which are both headline fees and the more hidden fees. Um, the, the fees that go to portfolio companies are, are pretty significant uh, and so I think those things are going to be the focus of a lot of attention. Indeed, in the US there already has been a lot of attention. The SEC is looking carefully at the fees that are charged for private, by private equity funds to their portfolio companies and I think this may ironically, as I say, be their salvation because it may help to drive down fees because of the intervention of regulators, even though investors hadn't been really driving, uh, uh, maybe objecting as much as they should have done. Um, now, to end on a slightly more sort of positive note, I personally think that the fact that those pre-crisis LBO funds actually performed 
only slightly below public markets is actually very impressive because you know you would have expected leveraged equity returns to uh, or portfolio companies with very highly leveraged uh, capital structures with lots of debt to perform very badly and to have gone bankrupt and things when the financial crisis struck. Um, whereas I think that um, uh, you know you, the, it shows an impressive ability for private equity funds to sort of manage through a crisis and set up fairly robust capital structures for their businesses. And I also think there's an interesting lesson here to be learned that to some extent the very illiquidity of private equity may be, its, may be another positive aspect. The fact that investors sort of commit to a private equity fund for 10 years and therefore they have to commit to the private equity fund who's working through a hard period means that they can't quit when the going gets tough. Neither side can quit, the investors, neither the investors nor the funds. And the fact that these fund performance, this fund performance came back is a positive thing. It meant that investors didn't quit at the wrong time. And so actually, I think that it's, that's one of my thoughts here is, is that actually there's a lot of evidence behaviorally which says people tend to quit investments or sell after falls and buy bef after rises. And that generally speaking, that's a very bad thing to do. And that private equity structures sort of stop you from doing that. Um, now, just to finish off, will we get back to three to four percent returns over public markets? I sort of doubt it, especially at the moment, because there's so much money flooding in to the asset class. But you know, I think that it might be that uh, the returns. I think that funds will continue to produce uh, good returns. Some of those funds will outperform public markets. Uh, if you get into the best performing ones, they always have historically always done so. But that um, you know that some of those net returns, those future net returns, may well come from lower fees, uh, lower fee structures, which I think are also uh, inevitably going to uh, be needed. If you want more on this, um, just Google my name and private equity uh, and you'll get it pretty quickly, or you can go to ssrn.com where um, all my working papers are available. But uh, with that, I will hand, uh, I'll hand back to Brad. Great. Thank you very much, Tim, for for today's webinar. We will be taking uh, a number of questions, um, so please do send them in. Uh, luckily enough, we have a number already, um, so I will, I will start reading them out for Tim to answer. So the first question, Tim, is from uh, Sanjay Mohanty. Sanjay, good for you to join us again. Um, Sanjay asks, explain the difference or what explains the difference in performance between private markets versus public markets? David Swenson of Yale said manager selection is all that mattered. What are the other reasons? Well, um, the reason why public markets uh, uh, and private equity markets might have different performance is in my view at a fundamental level down to a different governance system. So you, um, you have a, uh, a in the public markets, you have um, management teams who are um, where there's dispersed ownership. Uh, you've got boards of directors which oversee the management team, and the management teams may have a stake in the business, but it might be quite a small stake. And so you've got this sort of separation of ownership and control. Um, and in the public markets, you have a lot of focus on executive pay, on bonuses, on things like that, and. Um, uh, and you've also got a lot of focus on short run, hitting your targets, uh, quarterly reporting, analyst forecasts and things like that. In the private equity market, you've got a very different governance structure where, where you uh, can take, I think, a longer term um, uh, sort of objective with the company and that you can set very sharp incentives for the management. Um, you can operate with very different capital structures which can be more efficient for some businesses. And I think that the fundamental drivers here are those that you, you may, it, for some companies it can be a trans, uh, you can do transformational change more easily if you're out of the public glare. So when we see those median returns being above 
public markets. So what that's really telling you is, and you know, to sort of argue with David Swenson, is it's not all about management selection. In the in historically, if you'd thrown a dart at the dartboard and picked and, and got the median return, that was good. That was fine return. You were getting three to four percent per annum more. Um, and so, but of course, if you can find those best managers, the top quartile, top decile managers, then that's great. And, and, and investors like Yale, who have got long and deep relationships with the best managers and have done a lot of due diligence over the years, can do that because their, their returns have been very impressive. But even those investors who came in historically and got the average returns were doing well. And I think that that is driven more by the fundamental difference between the governance structure for private equity and public equity. Thank you, Tim, for the very thorough answer. We appreciate that. Um, the next question comes from Tane Dunlop, uh, who asks, is the excess return provided or not provided for by PE investment sufficient to an illiquidity premium for investors tying up their capital uh, for potentially 10 years? compared to the public markets? Yeah, it's a good question, and it's one that always comes up. Um, I think the answer to that is, in a nutshell, it depends who you are. Um, if you're an endowment uh, that's like the Oxford Endowment, investing for 800 years, the illiquidity premium you're prepared to accept is, I would say, extremely small. If you could get one-tenth of one percent per year more, uh, from investing in illiquid assets. Over 800 years, that's going to be a lot of money. Um, and, of course, it depends a bit on whether you need to sell these investments, whether you have a, a large need for liquidity as such. Um, so, I think that, you know, looked at, the, the liquidity premia are really um, investor-specific. Um, and indeed, if one looks at oneself, you know, if you are investing for your retirement, your illiquidity premium should be, I would put it to you, quite low. Um, if you're investing in the short term with a view to wanting to trade a lot and to maybe realize the assets and sell assets and move into real estate or buy a house or something like that, then, then of course you care a lot about liquidity and um, you know, you're, it, private equity isn't really suitable for you. So I would say um, that uh, most of the estimates I've seen of a liquidity premium, you know, they definitely vary between investor, but I would be, uh, for, for investors like pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, family offices who have long-term um, long aims, I would have an interesting conversation trying to argue with them if they, if they ever thought their, their liquidity premium was much more than 1%. Um, and in that case, Historically, earning three to four percent was quite good. Well, thank you, Tim. Um, our next question comes from uh, Deepesh Vider. Deepesh, thanks for joining us from from the poll. Um, and De Deepesh asks: Should PE fund managers justify their performance through risk-adjusted gain versus absolute uh, realized or unrealized gain, without considering the investment risk taken? Well, it were, it's a good question. It won't surprise you to know my answer to that is I think they should be compensated on risk-adjusted gain. In a way, the PME is, is a first step towards that, that you know, you're trying to account for, you're trying to mimic what is a close comparator in some ways, and it's trying to strip out the macro uh, market risk, if you like, from their performance, you know, market risk in both directions. That's been moving positively in the last four or five years, uh, but it could be negative. Of course, one can go further than that and try to say, how do you adjust for leverage um, uh, and the like. There, I think you have to be quite careful, and, 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 I, and this isn't the time or place. We could have a whole webinar on how leverage affects risk in private equity companies. But clearly, there are some, you know, as you take on more leverage, the risk goes up. Theory tells you it goes up in a linear way. I don't believe that's the case with private equity debt, uh, but again, I haven't got the time today to go into that. But I think your general point is well taken, and I think it's one of those things where when private equity was in its infancy, everybody referred to it as an absolute return asset class. In other words, 
they were aiming for to make sort of cash returns in any market. I think that the, re the evidence I've suggested shows that it's anything but an absolute return asset class. It moves in lockstep with public markets and so therefore it should be remunerated relative to the risks of public markets and the, and the return to public markets in my view. So I think uh, you'll see which way I swing on this question. Thank you, Tim. Um, our next question is from Shaw Ashafay. Shaw, thanks for joining us again. Um, how would risk-adjusted returns look for venture capital compared with private equity and public markets? Um, I think that his certainly. It, it, I mean, it's been a game of um, a game of three halves, if you like, um, uh, to use a footballing analogy. You know, in the nineteen um, in the 1990s up to about vintages which were uh, about 99 uh, vintages, uh, venture capital did extremely well um, and on any risk adjusted measure it did, it, it did very well. Um, having said that of course there is a big distinct, there was, even then there was a big spread in the returns between the best and the worst performing managers, more so on the, than on the buyout side but if you look across you know the the industry as a whole it did um, extremely well then came you know the dot com bubble which really hit the vc market much more than the um, buyout market the buyout market did reasonably well as you see through the through the you know the vintages 98 90 90000 were good vintages for buyouts and uh, they uh, but for the vc they were a disaster so you know then we had uh, roughly 10 years of very poor returns and now they're performing about in line I would say and so that's the third half is, is performing in line. You have to be careful though to how you measure risk because obviously the theory tells you that you should be looking at systemic risk, systematic risk which can't be diversified away in portfolios and I think that uh, most of the risk in venture capital is idiosyncratic risk. In other words there's a very strong chance that uh, you know, there's there's quite a high probability that a new venture will fail, but it's not so related to the performance of the stock market. Um, and so, when you're looking at risk-adjusted returns, you need to look at that systematic risk. In other words, what some people call beta risk of of the of the sector. And the beta risk of of the sector is actually pretty similar to the beta risk of buyouts. Um, why is that? Well, the the, the underlying beta, equity beta of VC is maybe about one, one and a half, something like that. The underlying risk of the type of firms that private equity buyout firms buy is lower but then they leverage them up and they get to about the same level. So maybe they buy a 0.7 average beta equity, uh, sorry, asset beta company, they put leverage on it, it becomes like 1.5. So I think the risks of these things have historically been similar. If, if you take a systemic risk approach, which means you have a decent portfolio of this stuff, um, and certainly, you know, the how they compared, how the performance compared then was just varied historically in those three different periods. Thank you, Tim. Um, got another question from uh, Charu Kaster, and Charu asks, how does the return profile, such as IRR? change across market segments uh, in terms of geography and industry? Yeah, well that's quite um, a, a, a complex question in a way. I mean if you if you look, the, the data that we have available at the moment is very good for the US, good for Europe and virtually non-existent for emerging markets. Uh, by which I mean China, emerging markets for private equity. China, India, Africa, Latin America is very sparse and, and it's very hard to give much of an indication about how, you know, in a systematic level, how good the returns have been. Um, in terms of geography, the returns in venture capital have been definitely better in the US than Europe. Um, for buyouts, they've been about the same. Uh, that's on IRR multiple or PME. Um, so there has not been a big difference between the returns um, in, across Europe and the US at least. Across segments it really varies over time. You know, you do see some, some periods where you get 
you know, really very good returns in certain market segments. Like, you know, there was a there's been some fantastic returns give in re, in buyouts in retailing. You know, especially in things like restaurants. You know, virtually every restaurant in the UK is owned by a private equity firm, um, and that's true in many European countries and indeed in the US. Um, and the returns they've made on those have been uh, extremely good. We saw you know, a bloodbath in financial services after the financial crisis, not altogether surprising. Um, so it, it's very variable and choosing the right segments to be in at the right time of the economic cycle is one of the arts of a private equity fund. So I think at the moment people are again looking for defensive type stocks which are defensive companies which you know, will do well if there is a if there is some sort of downturn again. Because I know we haven't had much of an upturn, but we have had some. And it's uh, you know it's now seven years, it's now eight years, nearly eight years since the financial crisis. And so very often you have another downturn after eight years. And I think people are looking for the investments which will do well if there is a downturn. So. Uh, yeah, that's one of those questions which is hard to give a simple answer to. Great, thank you very much, Tim. Um, we've got a question from one of our Oxford alums, Jay Sean. Uh, Jay asks, what are you using as the benchmark in your PME comparison? If a large cap index, have you determined if any of the historical private equity outperformance is due to size? Yes, and it's a, it's a, a good question. Um, what we uh, have done is we use multiple indices to work these things out. We always use local indices, so if it's a European fund or investment, we tend to use European indices. Uh, we very often use start off by looking at large cap indices um, like S&P 500 and like, but we also have looked at whether how they compare to the Russell 2000, Russell 3000, indices like that. You can basically benchmark private equity returns at any index you want and it depends a bit what question you're asking. If you're asking the question from the point of view of a large institutional investor as to what, um, you know, wh what's the alternative? If they don't put money into private equity, where will they put it? Many of them will say, well, we're so large that we will tend to go for the more larger indices, you know, where because you might say, oh, well, why don't you put in a small cap index, but small cap indices are often very small relative to the size of institutional money. And so um, you, can check up, you can check up the returns against all those. For that, you're going to have to look in our published papers, not in this webinar, um, but you'll see in those that we actually use multiple indices. The general result has been that as you move towards slightly lower cap indices or ones which have got smaller companies in them, the outperformance of private equity goes down a bit uh, but doesn't altogether go away. Um, and that suggests that there is a loading, if you like, in their it, it, on size. I think that they are, they do, they don't tend to buy the very largest companies. Um, they do tend to buy more of the mid-cap type companies. Um, and that the returns on those have been historically a bit better than the large cap companies and that's why when you compare them, compare them to those, um, the returns, the excess returns look slightly worse, uh, look, looks, look slightly smaller but they're still there. Thank you Tim. Uh, the next we have quite a heavy hitting question, I think there's a number of questions within this question from uh, Eric Zudnir. Eric asks, did you find any relationship between fees and our performance? Do you find any relationship between fund size and our performance? Um, what about the stickiness of our performance of general partners? And is there a difference in your study when comparing US versus European managers? Okay, all good questions. I'll answer them very, uh, uh, very quickly. The first question, have, nobody's really looked at that and it would be fascinating to look at it. In other words, do the funds that charge large fees do better? The, I haven't looked at that. All the data we've been looking at is net of fees, but it's a very good question. It can be very hard to disentangle uh, 
the true fee structures. Um, but that's a good question, and we don't. The, nobody quite knows the answer to that one yet. Um, in terms of the, uh, the the next question, as part of it, um, is there um, is there any sort of stickiness in the performance of GPs? We've looked at that. Uh, I can point you to a, paper, a couple of papers on my website which look at that, and the general answer seems to be that that GP performance has got much less persistent over time. So there was quite a lot of evidence that if you're a top performing GP in fund two, you'd be a, more likely to be a top performing fund in, G, in, in fund three, GP in fund three. But most of the evidence recently seems to be that that persistence has, has gone, has disappeared. Um, is there a difference between um, uh, the returns in Europe and the US? Uh, not very much, actually, except on the VC side. So the performance of fund managers, GPs in Europe has been uh, about in line with the US, certainly since the 2000s. Um, the, the US was a lot further advanced than, the, than Europe, so there weren't nearly as many fund managers in the 1990s in Europe as there were uh, in the US. But um, since then, um, uh, you know, the performance has been quite similar, and that sort of makes sense because it's actually a very global market, and you find global firms who have the same, who have offices in European capitals as well as in the US, and so they bring the same technology, techniques, etc., and some of the same personnel. And then the final question you asked was size and performance. We don't, we had sort of expected that as fund size went up, performance would go down. We haven't actually found that. Um, so uh, the evidence seems that the, there's no compelling evidence as yet that there is this sort of diseconomy of scale as the more money you take on, the worse your performance goes. But those are, are, are all, all good questions. Right. Thank you very much for your time today, Tim. Uh, we still have a number of questions, but unfortunately we are not going to be able to, to get to those today. Um, so, so thank you Tim for joining us and thank you everybody else for joining us on today's webinar. Um, just some details regarding our executive private equity program that we have here on the 9th to the 13th of May this year. Um, a bit of background about private equity at the school, we were one of the first business schools to run private equity and it is something we take very seriously. We have our own private equity institute which produces up-to-date research as Tim has uh, demonstrated on today's webinar. Um, so it's, it's a core part of what we do here at the business school um, and as you can see um, to complement uh, Tim's academic rigor we bring in a number of industry uh, experts uh, we bring in limited partners as well as a, a gen, general partner, Humphrey Batcock, who has over 30 years of experience in private equity and he focuses on alpha and how general partners create value through the asset class and some of the nuances involved in that. So, private, so Humphrey very much focuses on how general partners create alpha for for their clients. Um, we have Jack Edmondson, a limited partner from our very own uh, endowment fund here at the University of Oxford. And interestingly enough, um, Oxford University Endowment Management have committed uh, more of their portfolio from 8 to, to almost 19%. They've now committed to private equity. So it is an asset class that they are taking more and more seriously and allocating more capital to. Uh, and then to, to complement that, we have David Easton, who works for um, CDC. Uh, they are a development finance institution, uh, the UK's oldest, and they've been doing private equity in Africa for uh, close on 70 years. So uh, his, his session is very interesting, and it looks at how development finance essentially contributes to private equity, but um, they are a balance sheet investor uh, and their outlook is slightly different to that of a general partner. But it is very interesting to see how a DFI's activity 
um, can increase the scope of the asset class on the continent. Um, moving forward to some of the, I guess, unique selling points of the program, um, we look at private equity both in terms of the greater industry, but also as an asset in a larger portfolio. Um, and then within that, we look at direct private investments as well as fund level benchmarking and performance. So you get to see a bit of both. Um, and we look at private equity in emerging markets um, and their exit routes to those deals, which was one of the most important questions to ask yourself with this asset class. And then as Tim uh, showed in today's presentation, uh, we do look at venture capital as a form of early stage uh, private equity um, and we will be covering venture capital on the program as well. So I just want to thank you very much for your time today. As you can see, the program will run on the 9th to the 13th of May. We've, already, we've got over half the class has already subscribed. Um, so we are essentially over half full. So if you would would like to join us, please get in contact. Um, the class profile typically each year is uh, an equal split between limited partners and general partners. We also get a number of corporates and banks, banks specifically investing uh, in some ways as limited partners, um, often in secondary funds. Um, and we get a number of corporate lawyers who focus and offer uh, private equity um, transactions and M&A transactions on behalf of their clients. Um, and we're increasingly getting more M&A um, professionals and entrepreneurs as well. So um, the, the core part of the group are specifically working in private equity day to day and a number of uh, participants are involved in the sector but are also involved on slightly on the fringes and moving into the asset class as well. So please do join us uh, for this substantial five-day program and if you have any questions please get in contact with myself Bradford Peaston. Um, please drop me a line or better yet um, please contact me and we can schedule a call to talk about the program and the school in a lot more depth. So thank you very much for your time today and for joining us and look forward to potentially meeting a number of you in May. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.